When Steve and I were talking to set up the presentation, um, we looked at a, a few different topics. That I shared some ideas that I had and um, basically, ultimately, I thought if we combine some of those topics into a, a broader topic or if we try to touch on some of the, the various ones I had suggested, it ultimately came down to this idea of resilience. And um, I think this is one of the things that is maybe a more common word right now. It is one that we hear a lot. Um, but basically, resilience is this idea that the better we can kind of adapt to challenges and respond to them. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not difficult or something that we're not able to respond to. It's just about how we're working through that. And so that we are able to have these skills and it's about those next steps and how we're moving through it. And so with that in mind, um, I've got three different goals in terms of presentation and how we can actually get at this idea of resilience. And so this first one is being able to understand stress and what it is. And I think with resilience, you obviously have to have some sort of stress because it's a challenge that you have to overcome. And so if we understand what stress is, how it impacts us, why it can be helpful, but also how it can hinder us, I think that's an important starting point. Um, but then also looking at what are our typical responses to stress? So what are thought patterns that we have? What are ways that maybe our emotions start to get out of control? And again, if we don't have those kind of positive reactions, then it's going to be a lot more difficult to have that um, positive response and start moving forward in a productive way. And then third, being able to look at how we can actually demonstrate some mental toughness, how we can start to demonstrate some of that resilience and emotional control. And so those are three pretty broad, um, pretty broad ideas, but I think they, they do ultimately come back to this idea of resilience and um, being able to develop that within your sport aspect, but also just in your day to day. And uh, I think we've had to demonstrate a lot of resilience just with COVID-19 and all the changes that are happening. Um, so with that, I'm going to basically break the presentation down into three different principles. And our first principle here is that stress is actually an important part of peak performance. And we don't often think about stress as being important. We think about it as something that maybe we want to avoid. Um, but stress is something that if we are able to anticipate and react to in a positive way, it can actually really help to um, elevate our body, but also to elevate our minds. And it changes how then we're responding to things too. So, um, there's a book called Peak Performance. It's by Stelberg and Magnus, and they have this idea that stress plus rest equals growth. And so you need to have these components of stress, of being challenged, of um, being in these situations of, of tension and unpredictability, and you need to have some sort of balance with rest. Um, so those two in combination are what ultimately lead into our growth and our learning and our development as an athlete and as a person. And so what I want to do, though, is I want to kind of look through, like I said, what is stress and how we can start to anticipate and utilize it and just increase our understanding of um, how it's actually impacting us. So with that, um, we all know what stress is. We've all been stressed. But basically, it's looking at how we're responding. And we're responding in two different ways, so emotionally, but also physiologically. So our bodies are actually responding to a perceived threat. Um, so this threat can be something that's actually real in front of us. Um, or it can be something that we're imagining. And so something real in front of us from a very basic level, if we're out hiking, say, and we see a bear, that's a very real threat. But imagined it can be, well, it's um, maybe I made a mistake and now I'm thinking that uh, the rest of my shots aren't going to go well or I'm kind of extrapolating that to what my end score might be. And so we're starting to imagine or build in this, this situation and that can be something that causes stress. But ultimately, it's about how we perceive um, these events and that's going to really impact our stress and so if we're perceiving this as something that's out of our control that we aren't able to respond to we aren't, aren't able to deal with then that's going to elevate that stress response if we start to look at how we can deal with it or how we're able to cope or how we're able to start taking some sort of productive action that's then also going to control our stress response and feel like we have the ability to to move forward in a more productive way in terms of um, that stress response, again, we don't always think about stress being good, um, but there's, this is called an inverted U. Um, typically it's looking at um, more of your energy levels or your activation, but you can apply both of those to your stress as well. And so typically what everyone has is this area that we need to be in uh, from a performance perspective where we need to have some sort of activation, some sort of stress in order to get into our best performance. And so when we look at kind of our energy levels from a zero or a one, when we're asleep, um, not moving, just um, those, those twos, those threes are kind of very low energy, um, just kind of sitting, moving around up to a 10 where we're in kind of a very high danger situation. We want to be somewhere in the middle of that. And that's going to look slightly different for every person, but just recognizing that when it is really low, we're not feeling engaged, we're feeling bored, we're maybe not feeling that motivated. 
but when it starts to get too high, that's where we really feel anxious, unhappy, um, overwhelmed. We don't know how to function properly. And so for each of you, it's just starting to think about what is my own kind of optimum stress level? Do I want it to be a little bit hope lower? Do I like it to be a little bit higher? Do I want it right down the middle? Again, anytime we can have an idea of this, it helps to increase our self-awareness. And then we can also start to take steps to get ourselves into that zone um, to go out and play. And so, again, this is just coming back to the idea that stress can actually be beneficial um, because we don't always think about it that way. After this, so I want to just take you through the stress cycle. So what's actually happening when we are under stress? Because I think this is something that if we can respond it, if we can figure out what's going on for us, then we can start to look at, number one, how it can be beneficial, but number two, how we can start to deal with this. And so to start at the top, you see we've got this stressful event. And again, I, I defined this a couple slides ago, but um, this is something that is real or imagined that starts to challenge us. And um, again, if we look at those real events um, where it's actually in front of us, it's something that we're having to deal with, um, or they imagine the things that we're kind of making up or worrying or that have the potential to, to be happening. Um, from there, we have to go into this evaluation. Um, is this something that I can cope with? Is this something that I am able to work through? Is this something that I am able to manage? Um, some people are going to evaluate that very differently. So if you just um, didn't have a great shot or a great hole, some people are gonna think, you know what? I'll shake it off, I'm gonna focus on the next one, I'm gonna take some deep breaths to calm myself down. They don't, uh, they evaluate that as very manageable and they don't get stressed and they, they might have a, a bit of a response in terms of the rest of the cycle, but it's not gonna be overly elevated. But if an athlete or a coach or an individual thinks, you know what, that's, that's horrible, now my score is going to go to this, and they start to compare themselves, they start to think back to past situations where that's happened, they evaluate it quite negatively, and then their stress starts to elevate as well. What happens um, is then our body starts to kick in, and it releases a number of different chemicals, a number of different hormones that start to get our body ready to react to this threat or react to this challenge. Um, back in kind of the cave days, we needed to have these responses. It helped us to be able to protect ourselves and to be able to survive. We aren't always in those kinds of uh, life or death situations right now, but we still have the same response as a way to try to protect ourselves. Um, it's when it starts to become um, pervasive, it starts to happen over and over, that stress can get quite negative. In terms of the physical and emotional response, um, when you think about how you feel when you're stressed, I think it's important to recognize uh, what you might feel, and we'll talk about that on the next slide, but um, things like elevated heart rate, um, increased breathing rate, our pupils actually start to dilate. All these different physical responses are ways to just try to help our body get ready to respond to that threat. Um, typically, um, blood starts getting diverted back to kind of our core, so we might feel like there's a change in temperature where our body, kind of our core body feels really hot and our limbs feel colder just because there's not as much blood flow. So lots of different things that are happening there. But then also emotionally we have a response because this chemical response and these hormones that are being released are impacting how our brain is processing things. So sometimes it feels like our thoughts are racing, like we aren't able to hone down on one thing. Sometimes it feels like we've only got one thought in our mind and our attention is honed in just on that. Um, sometimes it feels like we're getting really irritable um, because we want to be able to just deal with this and get it through. So again, there's lots of different physical and emotional responses. We'll talk about that on the next page and you'll have a, a chance to do some reflection. But if we can understand what our early signs are for stress, what our early um, physical responses or early emotional responses are, that can really help us to be able to target our behavior in a more positive way. Typically, um, our behavior is gonna be looking at kind of three, I guess, evolutionary responses. Uh, so we have the fight response, the flight response, and the freeze response again, as a way to try to manage this threat or manage this, uh, this situation that's going on. So again, just taking it back to that very basic, uh, you see a bear when you're out hiking, you might have to fight the bear. Uh, you might have to try to defend yourself however you can. And so our body is trying to prepare ourselves for that. You might have to try and run away if you feel like you can outrun the bear and that's going to be your best bet. Again, it's preparing your, your body and your limbs to be able to run as quickly as you can. Um, sometimes it's going to be maybe more beneficial just to freeze up if you feel like they don't see you and you can just be still and quiet and they can move on. Um, that can be helpful too. And so again, sometimes we apply these situations or these behaviors in our day-to-day -day life right now where um, we get stressed and we get really angry, we get really irritable, we lash out. Um, we have kind of that fight response, even though we're not necessarily faced with a bear. Sometimes we have that uh, flight response where we want to 
try to get out of that stressful situation. So there can be avoidance, there can be procrastination, there can just be uh, not dealing with the things that you're maybe supposed to be responding to, some withdrawal, um, lack of communication. Those can be some of the different responses you might see. And then also looking at um, that freeze up where you just feel like you can't do anything, you can't make decisions, um, you're maybe wanting to just nap or rest instead of taking action. So again, I think just knowing what this stress response is and looking at, I think the key pieces here are the evaluation. Also knowing that we can respond in different ways, having that early idea of what your typical stress responses are, and then being able to have very targeted specific behavioral responses. Those are the three different categories that if we can start targeting those, it really helps us to feel like we've got a better response and then feel like we're more in control. And then that in turn starts to minimize the stress just because again, we've got this action plan. <clears throat> So from here, um, what I'm gonna do is go through these stress signs and symptoms. I know there's a lot, um, but what I want to do is just really show you that everyone can respond to stress in different ways. And there's no one kind of universal way to respond to stress. As I'm going through it, what I do want you to do is just kind of think about what is typical for you. What are some of the things that you notice? Um, you might feel that you've got signs in all these different categories. You might feel that you just maybe demonstrate signs in a couple of them. Um, you can also, at this point, you can pull up your worksheet if you want. I'll give you some time after I go through it, but your worksheet has um, this outline and you're able to uh, fill in some of the different things that you're noticing for yourself. Um, I will give you some dedicated time for it after I review this. So, In terms of affective, um, so those affective stress signs and symptoms, um, this is gonna be your emotional response. And again, we respond emotionally just because we've got all these changes that are going on in our body. And if we don't feel like we've got the coping resources to manage this, we're going to have uh, a lot of response because we feel very out of control. So I talked about the anger that can be associated often with that fight response. The anxiety is often associated with the, the flight response, just wanting to get out of there. Sometimes we feel guilty or sad. We feel like I don't have the this coping skills. I should have the coping skills. And you start to place some of that judgment on yourself, uh, maybe feeling sorry for yourself that you should have done more work or you feel like uh, you should be better than you are. Um, but then if you feel like there's nothing you can do, there can be a lot of helplessness as well. So those can be some of the emotions or some of the affective responses. Again, it's not going to be a, a total list. It's just some common examples. In terms of behavioral responses to stress, um, we often see sleeping disturbances where because our body is basically on high alert, we have this stress, we have um, our body trying to change our heart rate, change our breathing, change our blood flow, change how our thoughts are being processed. All of that can work to keep us awake, uh, make it more difficult to fall asleep, um, but also make it more difficult to stay asleep. So sometimes that's seen. Um, on the flip side, sometimes we see people really wanting to retreat, having that withdraw, freezing up, and, and sleeping a lot. Uh, people can feel like they're restless, again, just because their body's on such high activation. Um, you might find that you're, you're turning to uh, substances as a way to cope. So I've got drug and alcohol on here, but you could also look at food. So we sometimes hear about people kind of emotional eating or stress eating. This is a way to try to problem solve and um, none of those necessarily help from a long-term perspective, but it can be something that we, we try to use. Um, look at things like sulking or crying, feeling like you're crying for no reason, just feeling really overwhelmed. Um, sometimes what we'll also see, especially within a, a sport performance, if we get too high, again, going back to that curve, if we get too far to the right, um, we have that dip in performance just because we're overwhelmed and we're out of that ideal performance. In terms of at absenteeism, basically what that means is this idea that um, we're not showing up. So we're not going to events, we're skipping practice, we're not going out to, to play on our own or to work on skills. Um, kind of flip side of that is the idea of presenteeism where you're there, but you're just not engaged, you're not invested, you're kind of going through the motions without actually um, feeling like you're working hard or, or doing as well as you could. And then other behavioral responses that we can see, um, I put clenched fists up as an example, but just changes in body language. So sometimes it's going to be clenched fists, um, dropping your head, your shoulders change, crossing your arms over yourself. Again, lots of different body language that can come up. In terms of physiological, I've mentioned a few of these. Um, we've got increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, but with that, because of changes in how our body is functioning, we often have muscle tension where our body just feels tight. And again, if we have increased muscle tension, that can change your grip on the club, that's gonna then affect your swing, um, that can result in decreased uh, performance as well. Um, sometimes that, mus that muscle tension can actually result in pain that we're not really sure where it's coming from. Um, it can result in headaches, it can result in a lot of tension, 
um, again, talking about changes in blood flow. Um, digestion um, isn't necessarily a huge thing um, when we're in this high state of stress. So we might feel nauseous. We might feel like we've got an upset stomach or butterflies in our stomach. Um, we start to feel sweaty. We start to feel butterflies. Um, those are all different things that can happen from a body perspective. In terms of cognitive, basically this is how we're thinking. So the thoughts that we're having and what kinds of things are going through our mind. Uh, we might start to get really worried. So again, starting to project about what's going to happen down the road, how this is going to play out, um, what it's going to look like. We might start to really distort. So um, basically starting to have it not based in reality as much. So thinking that was the worst shot ever. Um, it means I'm going to play horrible for the rest of the game. Like you're starting to really kind of distort reality. You're also starting to exaggerate and make it into kind of a worst case scenario. Sometimes it can be, okay, well now I made that one shot, the rest of my game has to be perfect. And you start to create these unrealistic performance expectations for yourself. There's uh, sometimes perfectionistic tendencies that can come out. You might start to get really negative, start to really doubt yourself, thinking a lot about failure. So again, not necessarily a conclusive list, but a lot of different things that can be happening from that cognitive perspective. And then interpersonally, just changes in terms of how we're actually interacting with other people. So I talked a little bit about withdrawing. So not wanting to reach out to people, not wanting to talk, not making eye contact. Um, sometimes feel like just that you're more irritated, more activated, lashing out, saying things that you don't mean. Those can all be ways that sometimes you're interacting with other people. Um, sometimes, especially if we're feeling really stressed and we feel like we don't have, that whatever we do is not gonna make a difference, we stop prioritizing ourselves and we start looking at other people. And so we're concerned about what they're doing. Um, we start to think, okay, is there anything that they can do or um, is there anything that they are doing that I should be doing? And so there can be a comparison and sometimes uh, in a, a more negative way. Again, if we feel that we're out of control, sometimes we want to start manipulating things. So we want to start feeling like we're regaining that control back in whatever way we can. So manipulating things through conversation or through how we're setting things up. And we can also get very argumentative. And so again, I know this is maybe a lot of information to start off with, but ultimately we want to remember that if we can look at how we're evaluating stress, that's a starting point. If we can also look at um, recognizing these signs and symptoms, that's going to really help us to be able to um, then change our behavior and start to feel like we've got more control over how we're managing that stress and how we're coping. So as I mentioned, if you look at the handout, again, I had Steve send it out earlier, but I also put it in the chat. You can just look at, um, and sorry, I'm just pulling it up right now on, um, on my iPad, you can just start to look at some of those reasons or some of those ways that you are able, that you typically respond. And again, it prompts you to look at all the different areas. Um, so those five different areas, you might notice that you've got lots in one category. You might notice that you um, don't have many in another. Um, so before I just give you a minute or two to fill that out for yourself, are there any questions based on kind of what you're doing or some of the information that I've given you so far? So with uh, Lisa, with this little task, do you want us to think of a situation um, in particular on the golf course, or is, is this just overall with our, with our golf games? Um, I would say it's more overall, but sometimes if you can think about a specific situation where you did feel stressed, um, maybe it's on the golf course, um, maybe it was a, a big tournament or a tryout, um, maybe it was exam period if you're at school it doesn't have to be necessarily sports specific sometimes it's helpful if it, if it is but even just thinking about a time that you were stressed sometimes it helps you to kind of cue what was going on for you um right. that might be a helpful starting point but if you don't have a specific example it's just starting to think okay why did this make sense to me what do i notice um just based on how i typically respond so you can go about it either way just thinking about what are some of the the responses that you typically have okay We'll give you a couple minutes to fill that out. Um, if you have other questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, but you can also put them in the chat. You can do that to the group or you can do it to me directly.
Oh, sorry. And I just saw that there is someone requesting access. I'll go and I'm just going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to go change the access. Um, sorry, I thought I made that change. Okay, there you go. It should be all set so you can access it. Sorry about that. Let me know if it doesn't work. I'll just give you another minute or so with this. Okay, so this is going to be our starting point um, that we'll work off um, in a, a number of forms for the rest of the presentation. But um, what we want to do is notice, first of all, if you tend to have, um, I guess, maybe more symptoms in one of these areas. So say you notice your stress um, very predominantly physiologically, you notice your body responding in a number of different ways. Um, that's something to pay attention to. So if you feel like all of a sudden you get really hot, and if you feel like all of a sudden your heart rate's just um, increasing all of a sudden, those can be things to pay attention to because the sooner we can start to notice our stress, the sooner we can start to respond and try to manage it more effectively. Um, if you notice symptoms across all five different categories, that's fine too. Again, it's just trying to look at, okay, what are the first things I notice or what are some of the first things that um, are coming into play when, I, when, I'm, when I'm in a stressful situation? And so again, having those early identifiers can really help to feel that we're in more control because then we can start to take steps. What we're going to do though is we're going to um, jump into kind of our sec second principle um, and we'll come back to this as we uh, get into the third principle in terms of different coping responses. Um, so before I move into the second principle, are there any questions about the stress or maybe ways that we might respond? Okay, so our second principle here is in order to manage our stress, we must manage our emotions. And basically what happens here is you can see that um, with stress, we start to have a lot of cognitive um, implications. We start to have a lot of affective responses. And so those are going to be um, a couple of key things that if we feel like our emotions and our thoughts are really getting out of control, um, that can then create more stress. Um, our body responses, um, though, to some degree there's, there's less that we can do. We can do breathing and relaxation and those kinds of pieces, but we also want to look at the emotional and cognitive component too, because if we can really take steps there, it helps us to feel like we've got um, some, pace, some places to start and some additional steps to, to manage the stress. So in terms of that, um, again, just really looking at emotions being a natural response. So we have these emotions for a reason. It really helps us to figure out um, how we're responding to these different situations that are going on. And they are very natural, especially when we're starting to get stressed. And so um, our emotions and our, our cognitions, our thoughts are very closely tied, but also our emotions and our, our body processes. So those physio physiological responses are, are very closely tied. And so um, when we start to look at these thoughts, these emotions, um, being able to start understanding how they impact our stress can be really helpful. So what are some of the thought processes that you have that are helpful? What are some of the things that you want to remind yourself about as part of your pre-shot routine? Um, those can be really helpful things to be thinking about, but also just thinking about the feelings that you like to have when you're out golfing. So um, do you want to feel kind of more energized? Do you want to feel happy? Do you want to feel uh, more calm? Like what are some of the different things that you want to feel from that emotional response? And again, if we can understand that, it really helps us to be able to figure out 
how we can then impact our, our sport performance. And so even if we just go to this idea of that um, zone of functioning or go back to that, again, the inverted view and that area of optimal performance, thinking about what that is for yourself can be a really helpful starting point. So with this, it's thinking back to some of those best performances that you've had, best holes that you've had, uh, even just if you're out kind of having fun and, and practicing, um, being able to look at what are you doing when things are going well for you. And this sometimes looks at um, an opposite situation. Um, sometimes stress is seen as very negative and we're not playing well then. Um, sometimes optimal zones of functioning are seen as our best and um, when we're kind of stress-free. Sometimes you might notice that there's overlap. And so what you can be doing is just spend some time thinking about what is it that you're noticing when you're playing your best. And again, the more we start to understand that, the more we can start to recreate that um, just in our practices and being really purposeful, but also when we go into um, game situations. And so just thinking back to some of those best performances, again, going to that idea of optimal zone of functioning or um, in terms of the term that we had on the inverted view, the um, area of optimal performance, what are some of the emotions or some of the thoughts that you notice the most when you're out playing your best? Um, so again, that's the question that's on the very bottom of that first page of the handout. Um, but if you can just jot down some things there, so some things you're noticing either from emotional perspectives or, or thought processes, um, it's just, again, another way for us to start noticing what really works for us. So again, I'll give you a minute just to think through that for yourself. So I'll give you another minute or so with um, just writing down those emotions and thoughts that you experienced during your best performances. And so what we can do here is we can start to look at what kinds of emotions, what kinds of thoughts you wrote down when you're at your best. And we can start to compare those to um, the things that you wrote down above in terms of the affective and the, and the cognitive, um, the emotions and the thoughts that you have when you're stressed. And so when we're stressed, what kinds of emotions and thoughts we're having? When we're at our best, what kinds of emotions and thoughts we're having? And we can just start to have that comparison. Are they similar? Are they totally opposite? Um, there's going to be, it's just going to be very individual for yourself. Um, but being able to understand that, um, whether they're close together or where it's uh, kind of opposite ends of the spectrum can be really helpful. Um, we can sometimes feel like emotions are more difficult to control. Some people feel like um, their thoughts are easier to control. Some people feel it's opposite where they feel like the thoughts are coming into my head and um, I don't have control over those where I have more control over our emotions. So again, it's just trying to gain this understanding about where you're at and um, what kinds of pieces are going to be best for you. That being said too, a lot of times when we do start to feel stressed, we have certain thought patterns. And I obviously touched on that on the previous slide, but um, because those thoughts and emotions can be very closely linked, so thoughts can trigger emotions and emotions can trigger thoughts, it can sometimes be helpful just to understand um, some of the different thinking patterns that can enhance our stress or that can take away from those, those zones of best performance. Um, in terms of this, this next page, um, I think these are, recognizing how you're evaluating things and being able to understand um, that everyone has ways that we're interpreting or evaluating um, that aren't as helpful. And so again, if we look back at the stress cycle, the second one there was that evaluation and recognizing that if we can change that evaluation, that was one of the three areas that we targeted, that's how we start to get ourselves back on track and back into feeling like we're more in control. And if you're noticing these things in yourself, um, recognizing that this is very normal, this is how we try to deal with stress. This can be something that can be a very natural response. 
um, but it's not always helpful. And so it's not necessarily a judgment. It's just about that, again, that awareness that if we can start identifying these things and starting to make some progress with it, it really helps us to get out of that stress response and back towards our ideal performance state. So this first one, um, this idea of personalization, basically um, this is when we start to hold ourselves accountable for something that we had little or no influence over. So we feel like something was out of our control, but we start to take all the responsibility for it. And um, that can really make us feel like we're under a lot of pressure, we're under a lot of expectations, and we're, that we're the one that has to kind of pay for whatever outcome um, happened. And if it was out of our control, there's nothing that we can do about it. Um, but for whatever reason, we just feel like we're the one that should be held accountable or, or um, um, yeah, the one that should have to kind of take responsibility for it. And again, if we go back to the idea of stress, um, anytime something's under, out of our control, it's a lot more difficult to deal with. Um, obviously, bringing it back under control, our control can be really helpful. So sometimes that idea of personalization, uh, bringing that burden on ourselves can be something that you're noticing when you're stressed. Um, I talked a little bit already about um, this, this next one, the magnification or kind of the exaggeration that can happen, but there can also be some minimization that happens too. And so this basically, this thinking habit occurs when um, the impact of an event um, occurs when it's exaggerating. So you're starting to awfulize or catastrophize things. So really thinking about this worst case scenario, you're starting to build things up in your mind. Um, but also starting to minimize feeling like I, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing that I'm able to um, change in this situation. So there's this worst case scenario, but also feeling really helpless in that situation. And again, anytime we feel like that, we're going to have an increased stress response. In terms of all or nothing, um, this occurs when we think in really black and white, when we think in those absolutes that it's either this situation or nothing. And so you have to, you, maybe you're thinking I'm either perfect, I'm having a great game or this is going to be the worst game of my life. And so it's kind of those, those two extremes where you really start to think um, I'm great or I'm not. And that can, again, be one of those, those situations that places us on a lot of, a lot of pressure and can be, increase the stress. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, we'll also get into this pattern of mind reading. And the mind reading, um, I think, is pretty common, but it's actually um, especially common when we get into kind of a teenage range. We, with, with teens, you get, you're so social and socialization is such an important part of your identity and your development um, that you are basing yourself on your peers a lot. And so it's very normal, but we often think that we, we know what other people are thinking, that we want to know what they're thinking. And um, sometimes that can help us to feel like we're close and feel like we're bonding, but sometimes it can make us feel like we're being judged or that there's extra pressure on ourselves. So thinking, oh, they just saw me make that shot. They must think I'm a horrible golfer. They must be thinking this, this, this. And so you're trying to read in or coach this, just said this to me. Um, they must think that I'm, I'm not invested or that I'm not uh, taking this seriously. And you're, you're just uh, trying to, I guess, infer what they might be thinking based on what they said or how they're interacting with you. Again, recognizing that we obviously don't know unless they specifically tell us. In terms of discounting positives, basically what happens here is when we only pay attention to those negative situations. We only pay attention to the, the bad things. And this can really sway us towards the stress because we're looking at a very uh, kind of narrow experience. And I think in any situation, there are definitely going to be negatives, but trying to look at what those positives might be or what the opportunities for change or improvement are, that can sometimes be something that's really helpful as well. Um, I mentioned the idea of should before. Anytime we use the word should, we often um, just create that extra pressure and expectation on ourselves. Um, we set sometimes unrealistic um, performance strategies for ourselves or unrealistic standards. And sometimes those standards are ones that we can't actually attain. And so um, again, it's being able to look at instead of should, what are other words that um, I should be able to hit the shot? Okay, well, what can we say instead of that? I know I can hit the shot if I do this. Um, sometimes it's just a simple reframe. Um, sometimes it's just looking at um, the opportunity or the I wills, I cans. Um, those can sometimes just help to reframe it. And then the last one here, so blaming, um, where we start to take on that responsibility. Um, sometimes we're blaming ourselves, thinking, again, I should have been better, or I should have been able to manage this. Again, those shoulds come in as well. Um, but sometimes we're blaming other people and trying to kind of wash our hands of what happened and, and limit our involvement in it. Um, Again, sometimes if we, if we take responsibility for it, um, we feel helpless that we can't change it. Um, but that can happen as well for blaming other people just because we feel like, well, it was all on them. There was nothing I could do. And that can be difficult as well. So again, I know this is maybe a lot to think about, but 
if we start to understand our thought patterns and we start to understand how this can affect our emotions, it really helps us to be able to then figure out what can I do to be able to manage my stress more effectively and how can I get back to my best performance states. And so um, again, this is all outlined on the top of your second page. Um, I know I went through them on the just now, but it helps to have that reference back to it. And so what I want you to do is I want you to pick one or two that you notice for yourself and try to keep this grounded in golf. If you want to look at other situations, whether it's school or home or other activities, please feel free to do that. But um, so one or two of those thinking patterns that you notice in yourself, um, what you're maybe thinking or what's going on in your mind. And then also trying to think about what could I think instead? So um, how can I try to manage this differently? So if I'm trying to make it all about myself, um, how can I try to recognize some of the different aspects that are contributing? Again, I gave you some examples with the should, uh, maybe say I can, or this is what I need to do. So um, I'll just give you a few minutes to start thinking about that. Um, if you have questions about the different thinking patterns or what they mean, please feel free again to unmute yourself and to bring them up or to just put it into the chat box either to everyone or to myself specifically. Lisa, I know you said pick one or two. Um, I, I think all of these kind of fit hit me pretty hard. Um, in golf, it's tough because, you know, we, we if you have a bad area in your game, say, for example, chipping or, or flop shots, and you think of those negative shots more so than the positive ones that you do, and then and then you basically get in your own way. And, and uh, yeah, it's definitely discounting positives, you know, and, and I need a way to think of those good shots, not those bad ones, so that they, they I'm done before I even hit the shot. Right, yeah. Um, and what we are going to get into is just um, some different strategies. It's, that's kind of our, our third component is um, first two principles is increasing awareness, and then the third is having some strategies. But yeah, say as an example, the discounting positives. So I um, kind of focusing on all the missed shots that you've made or all the, the chips that didn't go well. Um, and a way to do that or a way to maybe change that would be um, prompting yourself to think back to a good shot that you made, but it could be after you make a good shot, rehearsing it in your mind as an example as a way to try to um, cement it there when you need to come back to it. So that could be one example. And I know I'm asking you to come up with examples um, without having given you strategies, but just to see what you can come up with on your own, because I think a lot of times we have really good knowledge and really good experience that we are able to apply. But that being said, I will give you um, some ideas and some things that you can be um, coming back to um, in the third part of the presentation. What I'll have you do, there's a reactions bar at the bottom. Um, you can just hit the thumbs up or the clap. Um, just let me know when you've had a chance to work through this. Um, it's one of those things that's more difficult to tell over video as if we we're in person. So just so I know how much time to give you for this activity.
Okay, so I think most people are done. If you're still writing, um, just take your time. I know it's sometimes uh, just a lot to think through or to try to come up with specific examples. Um, like I said, I know it's been a lot of information to this point, but ultimately it's trying to understand what your typical reactions are and how you typically respond to stress, um, what are the early signs and symptoms, but also um, from an emotional and cognitive perspective, what are some of the, the thoughts and emotions you might experience and, and how maybe that differs from some of your best performances. Um, like I said, though, I do want to go into our third principle and just start looking at um, how we can actually give you some strategies. And so this idea that part of having this peak performance is being mentally tough um, and having that idea of resilience and being able to respond to challenges. And sometimes when we think about peak performance, we think, okay, everything's going to be perfect and it's going to just feel like I'm flowing and nothing's kind of coming up. And I think that can be really unrealistic to expect that everything is going to be perfect all the time. And so um, being able to have this capacity to deal with challenges is going to be really important as well. And so understanding that you can still feel stressed and maybe feel a little bit overwhelmed and, and get yourself calmed down and be able to have a really good shot or have a really good hole. And anytime you're able to manage those challenges, um, whether it's on the golf course or in other areas, it just helps to reinforce those patterns and it really helps to reinforce those skills that you're developing for yourself. And so um, when we talk about this idea of mental toughness, I think it's something that, um, again, we hear a lot, but um, we don't always necessarily stop to think about what that means for you or what it might be um, in terms of your own performance or in terms of what you're doing on the golf course or day to day. And so uh, I'm just curious, you can type this into the chat. What are some ideas that you have about mental toughness? What does that mean for you um, when you hear that term or what does it mean when you see an athlete being mentally tough or hear about an athlete being mentally tough? So uh, if you have ideas, I just want you to type those into the chat box so we can get a, a range of things that this might mean. It, yeah, so we've got one. So being able to bounce back after making a big number. So um, bouncing back after you've maybe had not a very good hole or not a very good couple holes. What else might you see if you're feeling mentally tough, if you're noticing that other people are being mentally tough? Yeah, so being able to go through this evaluation process. So being able to um, understand what's going on, evaluating, and then being able to react. So yeah, it's, I think, very similar to that stress cycle, but using it in a more positive way. So you've got that reaction uh, and evaluation that are on par with um, how you want to be able to move forward. Yeah, being able to push through a resilient or a difficult situation. So being able to manage those challenges and feel like you're able to get through to the other side. Any other ideas about what this mental toughness might be or examples of what it might look like on the golf course? Yep, acceptance. And I think that's a really good one. It's uh, a word that I've, uh, it's been coming up a lot lately, just in things that I've been reading and things that I've been talking about with colleagues. But again, recognizing that things don't have to be perfect for you to have a good performance. I think that's huge. And um, yeah, if you can have that acceptance, kind of recognize, okay, this happened, it's done, I can't do anything about it, let's move forward, that can be really powerful too. Um, so I'm going to throw up a definition of mental toughness. It looks like a lot of words, but I'm going to encourage you just to hone in on a couple things. So it's basically the ability to cope better with demands or to cope with demands um, that are being placed on you and to be consistent in how you're coping with those demands. And so there's a lot of words about being able to cope better with opponents and being able to be more consistent than your opponents. But ultimately, we want to bring this back to ourselves so that we feel like we're um, having that comparison with ourselves and being able to have that growth as opposed to um, maybe comparing ourselves to um, other people, other situations, um, things that are going on around us. And so if we look at this idea of being able to cope better and be more consistent, anytime we can combine those two, I think it really helps us to, number one, manage stress because we're coping. It helps us to manage those thoughts and those emotions that we're having. But if we can be more consistent, it just means that then our performance is also more consistent and we're feeling better as we're moving through it. And if we're performing better, I think that's an outcome that a lot of people that want to have. But also if we feel that we're um, enjoying it more, that uh, we're happier when we're doing it, that it's just 
um, kind of a better all around experience, that's going to make it feel more fulfilling and more meaningful for us as well. And so in terms of that, I just want you to think about when have you demonstrated mental toughness. So um, we had a few examples in the chat, but um, what are maybe an example of a time that you experienced a challenge, but were still able to be successful. What was an example of a time where it wasn't perfect, but you still had a really good shot or a hole or a game. Um, so this is going to be at the very bottom of um, your handout. There's key principle three. And so what is mental toughness? Um, you can write stuff down there if you want, but the second box, when have you demonstrated mental toughness is actually going to be the more important one for you to focus your time on. So again, I'll give you a few minutes with this um, just for you to start thinking about what that actually has looked like for you in times that you've done that in the past. Yeah, perfect. And again, if you're wrapping up or if you feel like you've written stuff down, then just give me that thumbs up and I'll know uh, how much time you need or if you're finished. Okay, so again, I think most people are done. Um, if you're not quite finished with this, again, please feel free just to keep writing or keep thinking about that. Um, again, just kind of going off of uh, the responses I'm seeing, but recognizing too that people work at different rates. Um, with this, like I said, I want to start giving you um, some tips and some ideas. And um, I think there are ones that I can give and I've kept them fairly general just because again, we're trying to uh, kind of cater to a group of people. But I think this question here, um, when have you demonstrated mental toughness? That's actually a really important question to be thinking about, recognizing those challenges that you faced and how you bounce back or um, what you did to bounce back. That's actually really important information to be able to um, kind of buy into for yourself and start to try to look at how you can use those strategies again. So um, if, for example, you just had a bad hole or a couple bad holes with some bad shots, uh, you felt like you're really dwelling, getting angry, getting frustrated, um, what were you doing to, to work through that and come out and have uh, some good shots and some good holes or to finish off pretty strong? So, for example, maybe it was focusing on your breathing. Uh, maybe it was just kind of pausing and looking around and noticing the scenery and getting out of your head and noticing your surroundings. Um, maybe it was doing some visualization and kind of visualizing, correcting the mistakes that you made before and reminding yourself that you've got the skills to make those shots that you missed. Um, Maybe it's thinking about the good shots you've made before you started making some of those mistakes. So whatever it was that you were doing, I think is actually really helpful for you to pay attention to because if you, what you wrote down, it demonstrates that you do have those skills. It's just about, try, again, going back to the idea of consistency, um, being consistent with using those skills and being consistent with your reactions. And that can be um, a really big part in terms of feeling like you're coping and uh, demonstrating 
that you're you're moving forward, but also managing that stress in a more positive way. Okay, so like I said, um, some of these are general. I'm going to try to give you lots of examples within each one. Um, number one, remembering your strengths. So obviously, remember what you're good at. Number two, expecting discomfort. So I've talked about this a little bit already, but it doesn't have to be perfect for you to have a good performance. And then number three, being able to reflect on your progress. And so knowing where you've been and where you are now, um, that's another really helpful thing to do. So just being able to hone in on this first one. So remembering your strengths. There's lots of different ways that you can do this. And I'm going to give you some examples and it's up to you to figure out or maybe think about what you like, what you've done, but also maybe what you might want to try. And so with remembering your strengths, uh, one of the first ones can just be actually thinking back and remembering really good games that you've played, really good shots that you've made, um, really good holes that you've had, all those different times that you can remember back to specific examples. It just helps to, again, remind yourself that you do have those skills and you do have the capacity to play at that level. And that can sometimes just reaffirm that, you know what, I had a couple of bad holes or I had a couple of bad shots, but I can get myself back on track. That can sometimes uh, be helpful. Sometimes it's thinking about your strengths in a different perspective. So thinking about some of the characteristics that you demonstrate. So thinking about, you know what, I'm hardworking, I um, don't give up, I know that I'm a good leader, good communicator, whatever it is that you feel your, your, your kind of personal strengths are, those characteristics, that can be really helpful as well because then you can think about how you want to apply that hard work, for example, to what you're doing. And that can sometimes just be a different way to think about it that takes it emphasis off of your golf skills, but more onto you as a person and um, being able to play to those strengths. Um, with this, it can also just be very um, kind of pre-programmed statements about your strengths. So um, it can be in the form of self-talk. So um, I am strong and capable. That could be one example. Um, but being able to come up with like a, a phrase or a mantra that you want to say to yourself, um, that can be another way to remind yourself about, about your strengths. Um, one more example would be to go through a visualization process and to really cue into what it is that you want to do and being able to make, make some of those corrections in your mind. Again, that can help to remind you that you've maybe made those shots in the past and that you can make them again. So lots of different ways to remember your strengths, um, whether it's going back to past holes, whether it's going back to your characteristics, whether it's going back to those phrases that you want to say to yourself or visualizing future successes. But those can be some really good starting points. Um, I know those are kind of outlined. Um, and what you have a, a space for on the bottom of your handout is just um, if there's anything that you want to do or anything that you want to apply from those strengths, you can jot it down quickly as I'm chatting. I probably won't give you a ton of time just to um, sit and reflect. But if you're noticing things as I'm talking, please feel free to write them down. In terms of expecting discomfort, um, this is, again, like I've said a few times, it's this idea that um, number one, we can play well even when things aren't perfect. But number two, it goes back to that definition of mental toughness. It's the idea of being able to cope and being able to be consistent. And so one of the things that we can do with discomfort is have that anticipation or have that awareness of those early warning signs and say, you know what, I'm starting to feel irritated, um, but I'm not angry. And so that irritation is maybe easier to tolerate than once you get to anger. And so being able to anticipate and um, have those early warning signs is a good way to kind of feed into that comfort with, or, sorry, feed into that discomfort without allowing it to get too big. So having that awareness of how you're feeling and being able to interpret those signs early can be one starting point. Another example of being able to expect discomfort is to maybe make a list of different situations that you could encounter. So uh, yesterday was really windy in Regina. Um, Maybe think about different times that you've played in the wind and been able to still be pretty successful. Um, maybe if it's uh, other weather components that maybe you're just uncomfortable with. Maybe it's discomfort in terms of playing a certain course or against a certain opponent. Um, being able to think about those things, um, expect that you might feel uncomfortable, but also know that you still have the skills to be successful in those different situations and maybe bring it back to past situations when you've been in that uh, a similar situation and still been successful. Another thing in terms of expecting discomfort can just be looking at how can I problem solve this? What can I do? And so this goes back to, uh, for example, some of those crooked thinking. Um, we maybe don't like to really personalize it or to make it all or nothing. Um, but again, if we can recognize those thought patterns and if you can go back to those, those alternate thoughts that you outlined, 
it gives you this way of responding more quickly. And then that helps you to feel like you're taking action. So those would be some different examples in terms of expecting discomfort, being able to play off of um, what you've done in the past, how you've been able to manage it, um, using some of that anticipation to develop coping strategies, but also being able to look at um, those reminders about you can manage stress, you can manage those less than ideal situations and still be able to feel like you're moving forward. And that having a plan for how you want to deal with it can actually be really helpful as well. This third one, um, reflecting on your progress. This is where we start to look at some of the things that you've done and some of the changes that you've been able to make. So one way, one way you could do this is looking back at your progress um, from a season ago, from a year ago, and look at what kind of golfer was I then? What kind of person was I then? What kinds of situations was I, were I, was I in then? And being able to look at everything that you've gone through over the past year, the work that you've put in, the progress that you've made, that can sometimes be a really good way to just affirm that, you know what, I am making progress. I am feeling like I'm taking step forward, even if in this situation right now, it feels like I'm struggling. Um, so that can sometimes help just to recognize that you have taken steps. A second thing can be looking at um, just specific changes that you've been able to make. So um, whether it's shots that you can make or whether it's gains in strength, whether it's gains in uh, some of your mental skills, being able to look at specific things that you've made improvement um, on a, a certain task or a certain goal, that can be really helpful as well. Kind of similar is looking at maybe goals that you're setting for yourself and how you're working towards them or goals that you've achieved in the past as well. So those can sometimes be really helpful as a way to reflect on your progress. Um, another example too is just using some of the things that you wrote down today. So some of your typical signs and symptoms for stress, some of your crooked thinking patterns, um, some of the emotions that you experience, um, having this as kind of our baseline and then looking at your progress moving forward, that can be another good way to reflect on your progress and see that you're applying some of the ideas that you, you're coming out of this with today, you're applying some of these steps as a way to challenge yourself to be better. So again, lots of different ideas. There's no right or wrong. It's all about you being able to have that evaluation and figure out what it is that you might want to try and what it is that might work best for you. So what I'll encourage you to do is I'll encourage you to have um, one, I guess one strategy from each of those three different categories. Um, but if you feel like there are maybe two within um, that first, remember your strength and one within the expect discomfort and maybe not as much that is relevant within the third one, whatever combination that it is that works best for you, um, ultimately go with that. But if you have one for each, that's helpful as well. So again, I recognize there are lots of different strategies that I talked about, but also lots that I didn't. Um, are there any questions about some of these things that I gave as examples or maybe questions about uh, things that you're wondering with regards to um, maybe things that you've tried that have or haven't worked? Okay, so um, just in moving into a quick summary, um, stress is one of those things that is normal. Um, it's one of the cycles that we have programmed in us as a way to help us to respond to challenges, as a way to help keep ourselves safe. Um, obviously, we go through a stress cycle. Um, and if we can start to know that stress can be helpful and that little bits can actually help to enhance our performance, that can be, I think, a really good way to start managing stress and help to manage our evaluation. And again, it goes back to that principle that I mentioned that stress plus rest equals growth. And that if we can have stress, but also balance it out with periods of rest, both physical and mental, that's where we really start to make that progress. And again, that's another way that the discomfort can sometimes be helpful is that we go through this period of discomfort, but also have these periods where we're able to rest and recover. That's going to help us to be better because we know how to manage it more effectively next time. Just like stress, emotions are natural. They're part of the process. They're ways that um, just as humans that we respond, it helps us to um, connect to ourselves, but it also helps us to connect to others and kind of communicate our needs and, and what's going on for us. And so um, sometimes we think that emotions are bad, but if we can recognize that they are um, part of our responding and know what emotions we typically have in our best performances, we can gear towards that and really try to manage our crooked thinking as a way to um, get ourselves back on track to start some of those negative thinking habits and help to get us back into a place that's maybe more ideal. And I think we're, we're aware that mental toughness helps to enhance peak performance. We have this idea that resilience and being able to work through challenges is really helpful. Um, but ultimately, I think it's the, the understanding that you are able to do hard things and that you have done hard things and that you can continue to work through these challenges as well. And anytime we can have those kinds of reminders, it really helps to enhance your capacity as an athlete, both uh, from a physical perspective, but from a mental perspective too. And, 
here is really being able to look at what is it that you want to do? What are some of the things that you're going to use as a way to manage your stress more effectively, but also how to um, just manage some of those ups and downs, some of those challenges that you're experiencing on the golf course, but off a golf course as well. Uh, so I know we're right at 4.30, we're a minute over, um, but um, that's what I wanted to chat about today. I've got opportunity for questions and my email address is here as well if you want to follow up with uh, questions directly to me, but I'm happy to answer questions on the call right now if, if people have them, um, but also recognize that if you do have other things that you need to take off for, um, that's fair as well. Okay. I'm sure I'm sure there'll be questions coming up. We might have a few camera shy people, but uh, Lisa, um, on behalf of Golf Saskatchewan, our volunteer staff and uh, board of directors, we thank you very much for, for today's session and, and we look forward to working with you in the future and I'm sure there'll be lots of people viewing this on our YouTube channel and website. And uh, yeah, it's uh, lots of great information there. So thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. And like I said, if you do have questions and want to follow up with me, I'm happy to answer them. Um, as people start to log off, I'll just hang on for a minute too, in case you want to ask questions right now, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yeah. But otherwise, thanks for logging in today and thanks for participating.